American History by Judith Kofer. I once read in Ripley's Believe It or Not column that Patterson, New Jersey is the place where the straight and narrow streets intersect. The Puerto Rican tenement known as El Building was one block up from Straight. It was, in fact, the corner of Straight and Market. Not at the corner, but the corner. At almost any hour of the day, El Building was like a monstrous jukebox, blasting out salsas from open windows as the residents, mostly new immigrants just up from the island, tried to drown out whatever they were currently enduring with loud music. But the day President Ken Kennedy was shot, there was a profound silence in El Building. Even the abusive tongues of vigoros, the cursing of the unemployed, and the screeching of small children had been somehow muted. President Kennedy was a saint to these people. In fact, soon his photograph would be hung alongside the Sacred Heart and over the spiritualist art altars that many women kept in their apartments. He would become part of the hierarchy of martyrs they prayed to for favors that only one who had died for a cause would understand. On the day that President Kennedy was shot, my ninth grade class had been out in the fence playground at public school number 13. We had been given free exercise time and had been ordered by our PE teacher, Mr. De Palma, to keep moving. That meant that the girls should jump rope and the boys toss basketballs through a hoop at the far end of the yard. He, in the meantime, would keep an eye on us from just inside the building. It was a cold gray day in Patterson, the kind that warns of early snow. I was miserable since I had forgotten my gloves and my knuckles were turning red and raw from the jump rope. I was also taking a lot of abuse from the black girls for not turning the rope hard and fast enough for them. Hey, skinny bones, pump it, girl. Ain't you got no energy today? Gail, the biggest of the black girls, had the other end of the rope and yelled, Didn't you eat your rice and beans and pork chops for breakfast today? The other girls picked up the pork chop and made it into a refrain. Pork chop, pork chop, did you eat your pork chop? They entered the double ropes in pairs and exited without tripping or missing a beat. I felt a burning on my cheeks and then my glasses fogged up so that I could not manage to coordinate the jump rope with Gail. The chill was doing to me what it always did, entering my bones, making me cry, humiliating me. I hated the city, especially in winter. I hated public school, number 13. I hated my skinny, flat-chested body, and I envied the black girls who could jump rope so fast that their legs became a blur. They always seemed to be warm while I froze. There was only one source of beauty and light for me that school year. The only thing I had anticipated at the start of the semester. That was seeing Eugene. In August, Eugene and his family had moved into the only house on the block that had a yard and trees. I could see his place from my window in the building. In fact, if I sat on the fire escape, I was literally suspended above Eugene's backyard. It was my favorite spot to read my library books in the summer. Until that August, the house had been occupied by an old Jewish couple over the years, I had become part of their family without their knowing, of course. I had a view of their kitchen and their backyard, and though I could not hear what they said, I knew when they were arguing, when one of them was sick, and many other things. I knew all this by watching them at mealtimes. I could see their kitchen table, the sink, and the stove. During good times, he sat at the table and read his newspaper while she fixed the meals. If they argued, he would leave and the old woman would sit and stare at nothing for a long time. 
When one of them was sick, the other would come and get things from the kitchen and carry them out on a tray. The old man had died in June. The last week of school, I had not seen him at the table at all. Then one day, I saw that there was a crowd in the kitchen. The old woman had finally emerged from the house on the arm of a stocky, middle-aged woman whom I had seen there a few times before. Maybe her daughter? Then a man had carried out suitcases. The house had stood empty for weeks. I had had to resist the temptation to climb down into the yard and water the flowers the old lady had taken such good care of. By the time Eugene's family moved in, the yard was a tangled mass of weeds. The father had spent several days mowing, and when he finished, from where I sat, I could see the red, yellow, and purple clusters that meant flowers to me. I didn't see this family sit down at the kitchen table together. It was just the mother, a red-headed tall woman who wore a white uniform, a nurse's, I guessed it was. The father was gone before I got up in the morning and was never there at dinner time. I only saw him on weekends when they sometimes sat on lawn chairs under the oak tree, each hidden behind a section of the newspaper. And there was Eugene. He was tall and blonde and he wore glasses. I liked him right away because he sat at the kitchen table and read books for hours. That summer, before we had even spoken one word to each other, I kept him company on my fire escape. Once school started, I looked for him in all my classes, but PS 13 was a huge overpopulated place and it took me days and many discreet questions to discover that Eugene was in honors classes for all his subjects. Classes that were not open to me because English was not my first language, though I was a straight A student. After much maneuvering, I managed to run into him in the hallway where his locker was, on the other side of the building from mine, and in study hall at the library where he first seemed to notice me but did not speak, and finally, on the way home after school one day, when I decided to approach him directly, though my stomach was doing somersaults. I was ready for rejection, snobbery, the worst. But when I came up to him, practically panting in my nervousness, and blurted out, you're Eugene, right? He smiled, pushed his glasses up on his nose, and nodded. I saw then that he was blushing deeply. Eugene liked me, but he was shy. I did most of the talking that day. He nodded and smiled a lot. In the weeks that followed, we walked home together. He would linger at the corner of the building for a few minutes, then walk down to his two-story house. It was not until Eugene moved into that house that I noticed that the building blocked most of the sun, and that the only spot that got a little sunlight during the day was the tiny square of earth the old woman had planted with flowers. I did not tell Eugene that I could see inside his kitchen from my bedroom. I felt dishonest, but I liked my secret sharing of his evenings, especially now that I knew what he was reading since we chose our books together at the school library. One day, my mother came into my room as I was sitting on the windowsill, staring out. In her abrupt way, she said, Elena, you are acting moony. Inamorata was what she really said. That is, like a girl, stupidly infatuated. Since I had turned 14 and started menstruating, my mother had been, given, had been more vigilant than ever. She acted as if I was going to go crazy or explode or something if she didn't watch me and nag me all the time about being a senorita now. She kept talking about virtue, morality, and other subjects that did not interest me in the least. My mother was unhappy in Patterson. 
My father had a good job at the blue jeans factory in Passaic, and soon, he kept assuring us, we would be moving to our own house there. Every Sunday, we drove out to the suburbs of Patterson, Clifton, Passaic, out to where people mowed grass on Sundays in the summer, and where children made snowmen in the winter from pure white snow, not like the gray slush of Patterson, which seemed to fall from the sky in that hue. I had learned to listen to my parents' dreams, which were spoken in Spanish as fairy tales, like the stories about life in this island paradise of Puerto Rico before I was born. I had been to the island once as a little girl to grandmother's funeral, and all I remembered was wailing women in black, my mother becoming hysterical and being given a pill that made her sleep two days, and me feeling lost in a crowd of strangers, all claiming to be my aunts, uncles, and cousins. I had actually been glad to return to the city. We had not been back there since then, though my parents talked constantly about buying a house on the beach someday, retiring on the island. That was a common topic among the residents of the building. As for me, I was going to go to college and become a teacher. But after meeting Eugene, I began to think of the present more than of the future. What I wanted now was to enter that house I had watched for so many years. I wanted to see the other rooms where the old people had lived and where the boy spent his time. Most of all, I wanted to sit at the kitchen table with Eugene like two adults, like the old man and his wife had done, maybe drink some coffee and talk about books. I had started reading Gone with the Wind. I was enthralled by it, with the daring and the passion of the beautiful girl living in a mansion and with her devoted parents and the slaves who did everything for them. I didn't believe such a world had ever really existed. And I wanted to ask Eugene some questions since he and his parents, he had told me, had come up from Georgia, the same place where the novel was set. His father worked for a company that had transferred him to Patterson. His mother was very unhappy. Eugene said in his beautiful voice that rose and fell over the, over the words in a strange, lilting way. The kids at school called him the hick and made fun of the way he talked. I knew I was his only friend so far, and I liked that. Though I felt sad for him sometimes. Skinny bones and the hick was what they called us at school when we were seen together. The day Mr. De Palma came out into the cold and asked us to line up in front of him, was the day that President Kennedy was shot. Mr. De Palma, a short, muscular man with slicked down black hair, was the science teacher, PE coach, and disciplinarian at PS 13. He was the teacher to whose homeroom you got assigned if you were a troublemaker. And the man called out to break up playground fights and to escort violently angry teenagers to the office and Mr. De Palma was the man who called your parents in for a quote-unquote conference. That day, he stood in front of two rows of mostly black and Puerto Rican kids, brittle from their efforts to keep moving on a November day that was turning bitter cold. Mr. De Palma, to our complete shock, was crying, not just silent adult tears, but really sobbing. There were a few titters from the back of the line where I stood shivering. Listen, Mr. De Palma raised his arms over his head as if he were about to conduct an orchestra. His voice broke and he covered his face with his hands. His barrel chest was heaving. Someone giggled behind me. Listen, he repeated, something awful has happened. A strange gurgling came from his throat. 
and he turned around and spat on the cement behind him. Gross, someone said, and there was a lot of laughter. The president is dead, you idiots. I should have known that wouldn't mean anything to a bunch of losers like you kids. Go home. He was shrieking now. No one moved for a minute or two, but then a big girl let out a, yeah, and ran to get her books piled up with the others against the brick wall of the school building. The others followed in a mad scramble to get to their things before somebody caught on. It was still an hour before the dismissal bell. A little scared, I headed for a building. There was an eerie feeling on the streets. I looked into Mario's drugstore, a favorite hangout for the high school crowd, but there were only a couple of old Jewish men at the soda bar talking with their short order cook in tones that sounded almost angry, but they were keeping their voices low. Even the traffic on one of the busiest interse intersections in Patterson, Straight Street and Park Avenue seemed to be moving slower. There were no horns blasting that day. At a building, the usual little group of unemployed men were not hanging out on the front stoop, making it difficult for women to enter the front door. No music spilled out from open doors in the hallway. When I walked into our apartment, I found my mother sitting in front of the grainy picture of the television set. She looked up at me with her tear-streaked face and just said, Dios mio, turning back to the set as if it were pulling at her eyes. I went into my room. Though I wanted to feel the right thing about President Kennedy's death, I could not fight the feeling of elation that stirred in my chest. Today was the day I was to visit Eugene in his house. He had asked me to come over after school to study for an American history test with him. We had also planned to walk to the public library together. I looked down into his yard. The oak tree was bare of leaves and the ground looked gray with ice. The light through the large kitchen window of his house told me that a building blocked the sun to such an extent that they had to turn lights on in the middle of the day. I felt ashamed about that. But the white kitchen table with the lamp hanging just above it looked cozy and inviting. I would soon sit there across from Eugene and I would tell him about my perch just above his house. Maybe I should. In the next 30 minutes, I changed my clothes, put on a little pink lipstick, and got my books together. Then I went in to tell my mother that I was going to a friend's house to study. I did not expect her reaction. You're going to go out today? The way she said today sounded as if a storm warning had been issued. It was said in utter disbelief. Before I could answer, she came toward me and held my elbows as I clutched my books. Hija, the president has been killed. We must show respect. He was a great man. Come to church with me tonight. She tried to embrace me, but my books were in the way. My first impulse was to comfort her. She seemed so distraught, but I had to meet Eugene in 15 minutes. I have a test to study for, Mama. I will be home by eight. You're forgetting who you are, Nina. I have seen you staring down at that boy's house. You're headed for humiliation and pain. My mother said this in Spanish and in a resigned tone that surprised me, as if she had no intention of stopping me from heading for humiliation and pain. I started for the door. She sat in front of the TV holding a white handkerchief to her face. I walked out to the street and around the chain link fence that separated the building from Eugene's house. The yard was neatly edged around the little walk that led to the door. It always amazed me how Patterson, the inner core of the city, had no apparent logic to its architecture. Small, neat, 
single residences like this one could be found right next to huge dilapidated apartment buildings like El Building. My guess was that the little houses had been there first. Then the immigrants had come in droves and the monstrosities had been raised for them. The Italians, the Irish, the Jews, and now us, the Puerto Ricans and the blacks. The door was painted a deep green verde, the color of hope. I had heard my mother say it, verde esperanza. I knocked softly. A few suspenseful, suspenseful moments later, the door opened just a crack. A red, swollen face of a woman appeared. She had a halo of red hair floating over a delicate ivory face, the face of a doll with freckles on her nose. Her smudged eye makeup made her look unreal to me, like a mannequin seen through a warp store window. What do you want? Her voice was tiny and sweet sounding like a little girl's, but her tone was not so friendly. I'm Eugene's friend. He asked me over to study. I thrust out my books, a silly gesture that embarrassed me almost immediately. You live there? She pointed up to a building, which looked particularly ugly, like a gray prison with its many dirty windows and rusty fire escapes. The woman had stepped halfway out and I could see that she wore a white nurse's uniform with St. Joseph's Hospital on the name tag. Yes, I do. She looked intently at me for a couple of heartbeats, then said as if to herself, I don't know how you people do it. Then directly to me, listen, honey, Eugene doesn't want to study with you. He's a smart boy, doesn't need help. You understand me? I am truly sorry if he told you you could come over. He cannot study with you. It's nothing personal. You understand? We won't be in this place much longer. No need for him to get close to people. It'll just make it harder for him later. Run back home now. I couldn't move. I just stood there in shock at hearing these things said to me in such a honey-drenched voice. I had never heard an accent like hers before, except for Eugene's softer version. It was as if she were singing me a little song. What's wrong? Didn't you hear what I said? She seemed very angry, and I finally snapped out of my trance. I turned away from the green door and heard her close it gently. Our apartment was empty when I got home. My mother was in someone else's kitchen, seeking the solace she needed. Father would come in from his late shift at midnight. I would hear them talking softly in the kitchen for hours that night. They would not discuss their dreams for the future or life in Puerto Rico as they often did. That night, they would talk sadly about the young widow and her two children as if they were family. For the next few days, we would, we would observe Luto in our apartment. That is, we would practice restraint and silence. No loud music or laughter. Some of the women in a building would wear black for weeks. That night, I lay in my bed trying to feel the right thing for our dead president. But the tears that came up from my deep source inside me were strictly for me. When my mother came to the door, I pretended to be sleeping. Sometime during the night, I saw from my bed the street light come on. It had a pink halo around it. I went to my window and pressed my face to the cool glass. Looking up at the light, I could see the white snow falling like a lace veil over its face. I didn't look down to see it turn gray as it touched the ground below.